Welcome to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, five minutes for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for all of our witnesses that are here today. And since I only have five minutes, I'm going to get right, uh, right into it. Dr. Clark, uh, how many are all subject or uh, substance disorder providers subject to 42 uh, CFR part two? No, the answer is, are they all subject to it? Are federally assisted. Well, the answer to that is is no, and they're not all federal assistance because the VA doesn't fall underneath Part Two. Not all. Well, no, VA doesn't fall underneath it, and they're federal. VA assistance. has its own 38 CFR. But the, the question was: Is do all do all of them fall underneath 42 CFR? No. So, is there evidence that patients that don't fall underneath it has that been abused? Well, you invoked the VA. I used to work for the VA. I spent 14 years. No, sir. I, I said, is there evidence? Is there evidence that people that do not fall underneath 42 CFR Part 2, is there evidence of those that their medical records are being abused and they're being discriminated against? Uh, I couldn't say that there is. Because it's, no. Is, is, uh, is Part 2, how many times has it, has, has it been tried? Violators? People that violated Part 2, how many times has it been tried? It's not a heavily litigated uh, area. Heavily, it's never been. It's uh, never, it's it has never been, been litigated, sir. No, it is, it is exactly zero. I, okay. I had the information right here. And, and I know that you can give your opinion, but we're dealing with facts here. Okay, I'm a lawyer also, sir. And uh, okay, facts so, from 1970. No, no, hang on. It's my time. Okay. You said a lot in your five minutes. I'm just pointing out holes in it. Uh, now, underneath, underneath HIPAA, uh, how many times has it been tried? 173,426 times since 2003. Because part two is unenforceable. They can't comply with it. It's only a $50 penalty. You start talking about discrimination. In your testimony, you said that uh, the harms to which a person who admits to substance use may suffer includes the loss of employment, the loss of housing, the loss of child custody, the loss of benefits, stigma, discrimination, the loss of privacy and the loss of an an enemy. How would that actually work? How would this? How, how would you do this legally underneath the system that's there? Is that just an assumption that you're making? Because there's no legal way to actually do that. There's laws already that protects the individual from that. Is that not true? No, that's not true for those. Oh, there isn't. Well, you're an attorney, so explain that to me then. Okay, if I'm an active substance user, the ADA does not protect me. The Americans with Disabilities Act does not protect an, an active substance user. So there's not any laws that, pr that protect people from being discriminated against because as a person that also has uh, several um, uh, property companies, I can't use that information to, to, to deny someone from housing. As an employer, I can't use that to deny someone for employment because it'd be discriminating. Okay. So you're, you're making an assumption here that's, that's actually not accurate. Now, you also said that in your testimony that you're comparing my bill to the Cambridge Analytical Facebook issue. How is adding uh, anti-discrimination language and extra protection for patient information comparable to the Facebook data scrubbing? The issue is data scrubbing, just as you said. The healthcare... We're not talking about data scrubbing here. That's not, that's we not are talking about data scrubbing. Who's scrubbing talking? it? When you're talking about electronic health records, you're talking about predictive analytics, and you're talking about data scrubbing. Okay, that but we already show that the only people this covers is essentially Medicare and Medicaid. And when we get into the situation that private payers and VA, that they're not being discriminated against, why is this such a big issue now? Because you're making a lot of assumptions, and, and sir, I know that you're able to make the assumptions, but we're also dealing with people's lives. We are and there isn't anybody lives. in here that it doesn't be touched by. This has touched me three different times, and I take it very personal. And when people come here and they want to give their opinion, and it's not based on facts, it really bothers me. Well, I think I, it's I'm sure you're a very you smart individual. Sure, I'm sure you're a very smart individual, but you're coming in here and you're just giving your, your opinion. Well, you wanted to know about, the, for instance, unemployment. The ADA does not apply to active substance users. That is a fact. That's not an opinion. So I, I can't help you with that. In fact, there are rules historically for housing. 
HUD used to have and still does have rules that allow you to discriminate against people who are What active are those rules? Users. What are those rules? And besides, by the way, you just mentioned another federal agency, and this is about federal protection for those on Medicare and Medicaid. We're talking about the private sector because that's what you're making comparable to, comparisons to. And, sir, I, I, I am, I'm very serious about trying to protect people's lives here, and I know you are too. But we got to make sure that we're dealing on the same page. And, and while I respect your ability to give your opinion, I completely disrespect your testimony because it's based on opinion, not facts. With that, I yield back.